this down just slightly more. Let's go about there. So hopefully it's a little less whiny too. Yeah, it's, at least it's loud enough so I can actually edit the thing. Welcome everybody to episode 597 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentolaresco. I write stuff and podcast too. And tonight, tonight, I am with Diane Morrison, a.k.a. Sable Aradia, a.k.a. Huge Rockstar. I am going to be giving her like a quick desert survival guide. To- <laughs> because I feel today, especially for most of us who are like, oh my god, it's so hot. How did this happen? And the answer is magic. And and that's all I'm going to say. Like the answer is magic, global warming, blah, 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 blah. You know, you, like I said, never going to deal with it. But here's what you got to do. You got to look at the heat and go, how can I deal with the heat? Exactly. So the what? So the big secret, believe it or not, is salt. Is which? Salt. Okay. So here's the thing. You got two options. You got two options. Option one, power aid, plain potato chips. This is a wonderful combination. If you do that, you will be able to feel hydrate for much, much, much longer. Option two. You take water and you add a little salt in the water and you drink. Right? Sure. The reason being is most people when they think about dehydration, they think water. And yes, water is a big part of that. But more importantly than that, though, you have to consider also the factor of um, mineral depletion. Yeah, electrolytes. Water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a lot. It's something a lot of people don't think about when they actually are doing stuff like this. So you, that's the very first thing. The other thing is you're gonna, and this is this one is a very old school technique to cool down. Do you have vinegar in the house? Oh yeah. So just take vinegar and water in a bowl, cloth, apply to any area on you that's actually oh, yeah. hot. Out. So here's the thing about that. Now that little combination right there, folks, will break most fevers. It will actually help you with sunburns, too. It's not perfect, but it does a wonderful job with sunburns. And number three, if you are feeling really hot in wherever you're at, it will cool you right down. And it's the best thing about everything I just said. Salt is cheap as shit. Vinegar is cheap as shit. It's cheap and effective. And if you want to live in an environment where... 45 degrees is not in hot Fahrenheit, a.k.a. Well, Celsius, sorry. Celsius, 115, 116. Fahrenheit is not an impossibility. That's it. I lived in Phoenix. I walked around in Phoenix. I wasn't doing the air conditioner air conditioner stuff when I was there. It helps a lot. You, 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 nice. You, yeah. You can get comfy. I mean, there's no, there's no guaranteed way that you're going to get, like, you know, Fully comfortable in the heat, but, mm. but you, but you, it here, it's it's right now. It doesn't go above. It's not going to go above 33 degrees Celsius. But I'm in a humid place, which means it, it sucks in a different way. You don't get quite right. hot, but it still sucks balls. It still completely sucks balls because now you get <laughs> now, at least you're dry, man. You're right, at least you're dry, right? There is that. Um, the reason why we're having this conversation is that I live in the BC interior, so you may have heard about the record-breaking heat wave out here. And uh, yesterday, I was literally so hot I could not concentrate on anything else. The air conditioner would not stay on at all. Now we're used to it getting fairly hot in the summer, but not like this. So, but I've been in Ontario around Niagara Falls in September, and I'll take this honestly. Yeah. And, and so, so let's, there's one more thing you can do, um, and this is this one's going to probably surprise you a little bit as well, but this actually is a big thing. Iodine. A little bit of iodine. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Okay, cool. Do you know why? No, I don't. Your thyroid is actually produces iodine and then converts it into an iodide that goes through your body. It actually controls your body temperature. So, oh. take a little iodine. And you put it in like put it in like a liquid to drink. Don't take it straight, but straight. It's too much to drink. You will give your body tools to actually cool down. Also, it has the additional benefit of actually healing you from stuff too. Clever. 
and these are all incredibly cheap ways of doing it. And because we live in a world that has a tendency to, to charge premium for help, this is like, so finding cheap, effective ways of doing it is honestly the way to do it. And this is what I, I was very fortunate in that my dad was very much a naturopath in his younger days and still very knowledgeable about it, although not his focus anymore. Um, it's the, it's one of those situations where using your food as your medicine is definitely the way to go, and that's kind of what I I've been uh, like I have a knowledge base on that. So I tend to I'm not gonna say distrust doctors or distrust the complex that that we live in in terms of health. Mm -hmm. So if I can find an alternative that works very effectively and is also much cheaper, and I can do on my own, I tend to go to that route if that makes sense. Sure, it does. Yeah. Awesome. So, this is stable. Yeah. yeah. And this, this, our health, our health, our health, uh, our health conversation for the time being, our health lessons are there. <laughs> if you want to research any of this, I encourage you to do so. But I just, these are things that have worked with me specifically in my time in incredibly hot places. So, that all said, I wish you all to your best health. I am not a doctor. I'm just doing this. Hello, Eli. How you doing, man? Hello, Eli. Mm -hmm. Cool. I was like trying to get your uh, stream on the my busted ass phone, and I was not. Hey, Jack. How you doing? I didn't realize that the messages would show here in the program. That's great. Yeah. No, it does. It does. And this, Perfect. And, yeah. So this is Sable Radio, aka Diane Morrison. Eli is actually my last guest this week on Friday. So that's, oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, he's my last guest on Friday. Um, I have some, like I said, I have a pretty cool week lined up. So I have Susan Forrest, I have Stephanie Phillips, who is Hillary Quinn, and then I have Eli to wrap up the week. So I got a really cool week. Awesome. I'm sorry you're just, I'm sorry you're just okay, Jag. Yeah, I'm okay, and we had to think about this. That's too bad. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear it. Hopefully this will be entertaining. So now we got the health stuff over, let's get into the writing of stuff. So this is Diane Morrison, aka Sable Aradia. I had the pleasure of meeting her and dealing with her on the writer's conduit over the weekend. I hope I wasn't a terrible. You were self. amazing. I had a lot of fun with you. And yes. yeah, we were on a panel together unexpectedly about how to do an interview and he was a joy. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> Jag, Jag Susan's tomorrow. She's not tonight, she's tomorrow. So, but uh, no, it was it was fun. I, I, I got to make a royal ass of myself in, in a very fun way and it was good and, and I had fun and everybody seems to have it. Um, you know, but uh, no, with with everything kind of with everything kind of uh, um, like with conduit done, I figured get to meet some of the people in the community there, and and so and this is Diane, and Diane writes the stuff. But what stuff does Diane write? Diane is a Canadian science fiction and fantasy and pagan nonfiction author, and I'm kind of stoked about being on an Aurora winning podcast. Actually, that's uh, pretty exciting for me, right? Because, yes. yeah, right. Um, yeah, so that's uh, I do both short and long fiction. I've been uh, both traditionally and independently published, and uh, yeah, I. Uh, Josh want to be on the show to talk about uh, Kickstarter for writers, I guess. And well, so, yeah, I want, I want, I want to get into your crowdfunding thing because I do feel like that's a very undervalued thing. And I feel Kickstarter and like creative and writing in terms of books, it's still very undervalued. I'm looking at what like Russell Nolt is doing right now on on it, mm -hmm. and he's definitely like head and shoulders like the pioneer in, in this. But I'm I'm looking at this and I'm like, he does it right. And there's a market there that I think a lot of people are still not tapping into. It's something I'm going to be playing with. I keep pulling it back, but I know it's going to be next year. I have a board game book combo I've been working on for years. It will be ready next year. Yeah, Jay, honestly, Kickstarter is yes. what, it is honestly like what, one of the hugest markets that a lot are authors are not tapping into. I actually consider crowdfunding and indie publishing different because it's a very different game. It, it is indie, but not in the same sense. And we'll talk about that a little bit. I wrote an article about that actually for the blog 
couple of years ago. I'll, uh, I'll pass it to you here in the private chat because I'm not in the screen, but then it's available if you want to share it. Yeah, um, yeah because I was arguing that point. There's indie publishing is one side and traditional publishing is the other and somewhere in between is crowd publishing. Yeah. Yeah, because it's because it's a different audience targeting. Like because what what you're doing bas basically with crowdfunding, I'm gonna call it crowdfunding because it, it it's very much a campaign, whether yeah. you're using Patreon or Kickstarter. Although also there are differences between the two where they both have something very much in common. It's as much very much about selling yourself as a product. You're as yes. much people are coming to support you through what they know you, your works and stuff like that. And it's a very different game because your audience is smaller, generally. Mm -hmm. Not always the case, but generally. But they're very loyal and they're willing to invest in you. And it's a much different, yeah. No, Patreon and Kickstarter are definitely different. There's, there, there's different, it's a different, what, what you're supporting in Patreon is very different. Patreon's a very about, it's, I actually would, if between the two, I would say Patreon's more service oriented, ironically enough, because you're getting, to yeah, interact, sure. you're getting to interact with your audience and doing different things. I still haven't quite cracked Patreon. I have crowdfunded for my teeth, of all things, believe it or not. I got to hmm. fund it, go fund me. And it's, it's a very powerful thing. Nice. People will come and help, people will come help you. And it's true with like, and with what's going on right now with Kickstarter in terms of the comic book boom because comics are yes. big comics, aren't they, right big yes comics. yes and, and and the reason being is because again we have the publishing industry is niche and yes. has been for a very long time but so indie publishing still has a traditional kind of mensa right Go fund me if you do that, Jay. We'll, 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 if you want to talk to me about it, we can definitely do it off the air. I totally would be willing to have. I'm going to give you some pointers on that. Um, but with with um, with uh, with Kickstarter, right? It, it's like there is an audience there looking for really cool content, and like comics are killing it because comics have already recognized like we are a niche market. You don't need to be DC or Marvel or Boom or Image in the comic book realm to make an impact, make a living, find an audience, and you can get like bigger deals like movie deals, a video game yeah. deal. It's very much, a, like it's a very viable market. I don't think, Kickstarter might be the biggest publisher no one knows about. I think you're right. Uh, RPG markets have also been exploding on Kickstarter, the independent uh, RPG company. They've figured it out. And I've seen a lot of uh, small publishers start to put together things like anthologies. And I believe that some of the more, um, you know, some of the major science fiction and fantasy magazines have also started including Kickstarter and Patreon as part of their business model. If yeah. you want to do a comparison to Kickstarter and, and Patreon at some point, by the way, I can do that. I have a Patreon too. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, we, we, we can we'll talk we can definitely talk about it. But I, like this is the way I see it is it's something people are becoming aware of. I find it ironic because science fiction and fantasy is supposed to be like the fiction of the future, but I or fantasy, at least the world building, like is very meta. Yet when it comes to these more not quite so traditional models, especially science fiction, I have found to be very antiquated. I think the irony on yes. that has been delicious. It's interesting. I don't really know what that is. I'm, I'm not sure. I, maybe it's just a big part of the fact that it really is a much smaller community on the inside than it looks like on the outside. And people who have been around longer tend to not go anywhere. So they're still using whatever it was they were using when they got into the business, right? Which is fine, you know? Well, yeah. I, I think, I, okay. Yeah, no, Critical Role is an amazing example, by the way. But it's yeah, not the only one. There's point. a lot. Dice Throne's a personal favorite. Like, that's a personal favorite of mine. And it's a mm -hmm. really fun little board game that's really cool. Um, but, yeah, yeah, okay. So we, we got <laughs> yep. something common there. Yeah, okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But, but, um, but uh, what, what I think is, this is what I think. I think we, ha I think, tr again, every, you go with what works. And the fact of the matter is, for a very long time, book publishing was very much about doing it one way. 
you look at the fact that the big five is almost almost became i don't know if they're a big four yet yeah right? they are yeah yeah it's yeah, official. yeah yeah it's official now okay cool so now they're a big four eventually they're going to be a big two or a big one yeah yeah that's where they're going that's where they're heading and the reason they're heading in that direction is because the business model around the world has changed yes completely and those formulas still work but more and more it's becoming more of a niche it's not necessarily the way to do it and publishing has almost gone back to the very beginning again in one real sense in that the tra traditional came about because it was a more efficient model than when people were doing indie but now it's gone yep. the other way indie yes. crowdfunding is more efficient than the traditional market you can publish faster you can get things out there quicker you can market that as, as well and i think what's happening now is the big publishers who are used to moving at a certain speed and pace have to actually evolve and i'm not sure they can actually they know it i think but how do you do that yes yes and amazon of course changed the game for everybody even what? the big four have no choice but to deal with amazon mm -hmm. um and uh, th this limits to some extent what can be done mm -hmm. i also think that people have less disposable income Ebooks are replacing the cheap one or two dollar pocketbook you used to be able to get at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has to make that shift. And if you're going to compete in the e market, right, then that's a whole different set of marketing than what has been traditionally present in, in, in traditional publishing. Some are adapting, some aren't. Well, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, and that's like, and I, and the science fiction is like interesting because it's the one, the slower ones to adapt, I think. And it's yes. like, I think that's from an ironic, from an irony standpoint, hilarious. Like, it just like, right. I, it's just like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not like, you, you can't help but laugh a little bit, if that makes sense. Like, I'm just a little out of the absurdity of that. Uh, yes. Right, right. Yeah. No, actually, that's a great book. Jagged is actually a very, very great book. It's it. There, I think authors have to recognize today that more than ever, they are an enterprise unto themselves. Yes, they have to be, even if they're traditionally published, uh -huh. because the way in which the market is working, um, even the big four and most of the medium-sized publishers are outsourcing more and more of that kind of thing, right? They're putting their advertising entrepreneurship budget towards already established large names. If you're newer or a smaller selling author, they don't have a lot of time for you, right? Or money. So you pretty much have to do it yourself. And that's that doesn't matter who your publisher is or if you have one or not. Yeah, well, I mean, you still gotta do it. you still gotta do it yourself, even if you're one of the big boys. Like you go find you go find yourself. And but the thing is, it's it's like anything else. Like like the way the way big business works is the more money mm -hmm. they put, in, put put into something, the more likely they are to push it. That's that's yep. the nature of the beast. No matter what industry it is. Facts. Yeah, no matter what industry it is, that's how it works. So, for example, if you if you see a movie that has a budget of two hundred and fifty million dollars versus a movie that has a budget of twenty five million dollars, the two hundred and fifty million dollar movie gets made before the twenty five. That is how it works. A very good point. And that's part of why I agree with you completely that Kickstarter is a way underutilized and other forms of crowdfunding are utilized by authors and they should be utilized more. It's a way to bridge that gap. It makes some of those resources available to us smaller creators, right? Yeah. Well, no, it, but it, 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 in one way it levels the playing point. Like the one thing a smaller creator has over a large conglomerate is speed. We can adapt quicker, we're more versatile, yes. we can try different things. We can fail faster than a big publisher can. It's just the way it is, because we yep. are smaller. Right? I can get mortally crushed financially right now, but I'm by myself. So I can like money comes and goes. It, it sounds very super political. That's it's the truth. Like that's that's how it works. Right? Money comes and goes. It's time, energy, and opportunity that doesn't uh, it's true. We fail faster, but we also succeed quicker too. We find something that works. We can actually stake our claim faster than anybody else can. Mm -hmm. and when a big guy does show up, they have to deal with us. We can also make more, uh, take more risks. 
yeah. and take the chance of taking more mistake, making more mistakes because I, we don't I, have I, quarterly dividends to account for, right? But well, I, I think I think that also has to change too with the big, like with a bigger with bigger publishers. You have mm -hmm. to. The fact of the matter is, there there was a point in like I will say like the early nineties where it was you could you could take a back seat on the risk because at the time everything was kind of set in place. There was a model that worked, you knew how it worked you knew in a more efficient way. And to a degree, AP must have taken rest and then you know it was the sure thing. Now there is no such thing as the sure thing. Yeah. There's, an, there's an audience for penguin zombie apocalypses. There's an audience yes. for, for, for pro wrestling fighting games. There's an audience for like, there's an audience for everything you can possibly imagine. And even if it's only a following of 10, that might be the most loyal 10 people you'll ever find. Like yep. I look at like when the UFC rose to prominence, its prominence, it had it had in comparison to a lot of other shows a smaller audience. Very much but, so. But they that audience paid. That was the thing. And that's what we're crowdfunding is it's a smaller audience, but it's an audience that's willing to pay for you. Right. Yes. And invest in you. You find that, you build that, you prove you do a bunch of different projects. You can establish yourself and can make literally millions of dollars on crowdfunding. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. You have nope. to prove yourself, right? And that takes that takes a lot of work, time, calculation. But I mentioned Russell Nolte, like his last I did the Kickstarter was my last one because I I I I was like I want fairy tale books that are really nice. cool, right? But he he did twelve thousand dollars for four books, which that's was, awesome. Yeah, that's really good, right? And he did that over a he did did a two week campaign. But he's done so many campaigns, he has a certain track record. Also, far and away, I'm gonna give him a big compliment here. Most efficient crowdfunder I've ever seen. He's already sent my books out. That's and brilliant. I, yeah, it's like. I'm, I'm going to be getting them probably sometime this week or maybe after like the July 4th holiday sometime. That's faster than a campaign I backed two months ago. That's faster than an, another can. No, Russell's the shit. I mean, I mean him, I think I said this to him privately. He's a, and I, I'll say this as a compliment. I'm not sure we'd be friends in real life. We're just different enough personalities. That I'm sure. not sure we're friends. But I respect the hell out of him. He's one of the most professional people I've ever seen. And that's and I will say that to anyone in the faith, like he's that kind of dude and that's how you do it. So, and I, and I have to get Russell back on the show at some point because that, he did that that's the hows and whys. Um, yeah, he's that efficient, he's that good. And and like I said, he's got lots of experience. So that I mean, you get practice having your shit together. And I think that's the thing we're gonna talk about. The biggest key to crowdfunding, have your shit together. Yes. Yes. I have run two successful Kickstarters. This is my third and it is funded. It is uh, 17 days left. So yay! Thank you. Uh, imaginary demolition man high five. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Um, and I think one of the keys to having been successful are, is that I'm very accountable. I work out my budget. I make room for contingencies and i'm very transparent about exactly why i'm asking for everything that i'm asking for so i'm going to mention two things about crowdfunding that are very common i'm not going to say and they are actually acceptable provided you have that transparency books being late it's mm -hmm. a kind of thing at, like russell's good but he's the exception not the rule and truth is Printers screw up, shit happens. They the do. Important, the important thing, the important thing, if you if you are doing crowdfunding, always keep your audience informed when yes. things go wrong. They will forgive you an awful lot if you do. I'll tell yes. you a true story. I'll tell you a very true story. I backed up a comic project that now it's about holy shit, about ten years ago now at this point. And cool. and no, all right. So this this is a bad uh -oh. story. This is a bad story. Okay. okay. This is a bad story, okay. but it's a very but it's a very ironic story too. You'll you'll see what I mean when I get to the end of this. So things happened to him. There was there was a lot like shit happened, and I got it. 
But then there was a point there was just no more updates. Nothing was said. Nothing was done. Mm. There was no transparency. I just I gave up. I assumed that I assumed that the project was done. Here's a fun thing. I have a book that's um, nominated for a poetry award um, this year. Nice. Last year I was looking for. Uh, last two years ago I was looking for an artist for it. That guy asked me for work. I did not know how to answer him. Yeah. Because that that was like uh your track record with me and shit. Like, like I, would, is- I would have honestly said, look, uh I backed a Kickstarter you did and you never got back to me on it. I never received the product. How do I know that I can depend on you in this project? Right. Well, that, that, that's just it. <laughs> yeah, like, it, and it was one of those things. I like the guy. Like, he's a good dude. But it just yep. was like, I don't have a good answer to this question. It's like, I, I just don't because. So now I'm very happy with who's doing it. Like, uh, Kenzie Carr is amazing. And holy shit, the cover for my next book. It's just like, awesome. wow. Yeah, I, I, I no, I. I've been very fortunate in that the people I have tend to find have been like amazing. I don't know what I did to deserve such good things, but I will <laughs> take it. I will take it. She's actually the reason I have a day job right now and I'm not doing more freelancing um, because nice. you know, I got to make sure she's paid. Now, once she's paid, I won't care. I'll be like, I'm out. But like, I, 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 I will do it because I need to pay her. Awesome. Yeah. But anyway. Awesome. Let's talk about you a little bit here. So what was, I always ask this question, it's always a fun one, because we always have these books we read that go like, what made you want to write? And we all have that story we've read that's like, oh my God, I want to do this. Okay, the story, the, the story or book that I read that made me want to write, made me say, I want to do this. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, okay. I don't see. I've always told stories when mm-hmm. I, I already like, I ran out of books to read. I was a very prolific reader when I, before even kindergarten, I loved it. I took to it really quickly and I ran out of books to read and the parents did not want to buy me anymore because, you know, money was limited. So I started telling my own stories, right? And, um, I, I guess. It, it would the it's it's not a book the fiction book per se it was stephen king's dance macabre when he was writing about writing horror i was reading it and i'm like this is me i recognize myself i was 10 i was 10 years old <laughs> when i read that book and why i read it was because it looked like all the other stephen king pocket books on the shelf and i was just i'd read firestarter by that point and the dead zone I have a story about that if you want to get into it. Yes, this was a little bit much for a 10 year old, but I have a story. Anyway, um, it was just, it was one of the books on the list and I was like, okay, and they didn't, you know, file it separately. So I started reading it and I was like, no, 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 I get exactly what you're coming from. You know, stuff like um, the only ability of a writer is to remember the story of each scar, you know, stuff like that. It just, cause I'm like, yeah, that's me. I notice everything. <laughs> I remember I remember the story of every little every little every little hurt every little you know every little joy I and and I write it I, I talk about it I tell stories I always have so that was it that was what made me decide that that's what I was gonna do so I I, I, I have I have um, so my Stephen King thing I, I realized something about Stephen King not the first book I read of his but like after the second or third He's not really a horror writer. He has no, never was. Never was. No, you no. know what? Secrets, he makes his whole career going back to the classic works of science fiction and giving his own take on them, which yeah. is awesome. Oh, we all, we're, we're, we're all guilty of this on some level. Like, like honestly, we all retell, we all don't really tell our favorite stories, right? Right. Like, I, I'm retelling an Alice in Wonder. I'm retelling an Alice in Wonderland. And then the next yes. book, I'm retelling Fahrenheit 451. Because I, those were the books that made me go, hey, well, Alice was a little bit more like I met a girl at a bar with a Gorgon Tootsie. That's another story for another. And I was requested to do a, a Lewis Carroll story and just morph into this life on its own. But, awesome. Yeah. 
I, I, I started reading through um, the SF Masterworks imprint because I wanted to give myself kind of a grounding in the classic science fiction works that are very influential. And it's not a perfect list, but it's enough that it gives you a real kind of sense of that. So I was reading Earthabides, George Stewart, I believe is the author. And I read a scene in it and I went, that's where Stephen King got the idea for the stand. Mm -hmm. And I recognized it immediately because I, I, I was like, this is when Stephen King decided, got the vision for Larry in the tunnel in New York, right? Because there, there was another plague in the story. That was the plot that wiped out the whole world. The guy missed it because he was in a cabin on an isolated camping trip, came back. He's like, oh, shit, everyone's dead. At some point, he went wandering around the U.S. looking to see if he could find anybody other than the few people he knew that were still alive and he stopped at the new york tunnel and he looked in and he thought to himself there's going to be a whole bunch of dead bodies in there and i cannot make myself go in there and he carried on and stephen king i'm sure of it i'm going to ask him this if i ever meet him went to himself what if he had gone in right and there you go the stand yeah well i have a love-hate relationship with the stand i have a love-hate relationship yeah me too <laughs> I love the first hundred pages. I think mean, it's, it's one of the best beginnings I've ever read in fiction. I hate the middle of that book. It, yes, I, I, he got lost. He just I think you, you, you could sense it's like, well, what do I do now? Oh shit! Well, I gotta do something before I get to the climactic battle, and and I it hurt. It hurt a lot. It just it just did. I just not. It's not my. It's not for me. Yeah, not his best mushy middle. I have to agree. For yeah. sure. Yeah. I love his Dark Tower. That, that's my... That Dark my Tower? Favorite. You too? One of my favorites. A real inspiration for my other series, The Weird West Chronicles. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. for, for, for me, it's... And I've said this before, Wizard and Gloss is my favorite all-time Stephen King story. It's the best one I think he's ever done. That... Me... Yeah. You know what? I, I loved it too. I read it over and over. Yeah. yeah. It's so the best cool. one. No, yes. it's the best. Yes, it's it the, is. In my, opinion, in my opinion, it's the best one. Now, I think, now, the more Stephen King goodness or badness, depending on how you look at it, I think he's the best novel writer out there. He's got so many great short stories that it's not even, like, it's amazing. But for but for me, his novel length, yeah, I don't think he's, like, he's ever topped that. Um, my favorite, though, my favorite is Rita Hayworth, Trust and Redemption. I actually enjoy the yes. short. The short's really good. The mist is fun. I love. Yes. I, I love the little sisters of Aloria. It's still one of my favorites. Um, yep. Right. So, and Hearts in Atlantis is actually pretty good too. I, I actually think it's there. You know, I haven't read that one yet, so no spoilers. No, no. What, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I haven't spoiled anything yet, so. Okay. Uh, but uh, no, like he is, he's required reading, I think, because of just of just the mm -hmm. impact he's had in literature. He is like like he's all, like no matter where traditional publishing goes, he will always have a place in it, and that's and that's to his credit. I mean, I don't know if we have a modern day Shakespeare. I mean, the only person I can think that made as big an impact in, in, in literature as he did, believe it or not, is Doctor Seuss. So oh, I mean, right. yeah, I mean, so I mean, from the twentieth century, it is Stephen King and Doctor Seuss, and. I don't know if there's anybody else that's made that impact. Now you can talk like in other mediums. You can talk Will Eisner. You could talk Jack Kirby. You could talk like cart like television. You could talk like Chuck Jones. You could talk a few other like great storytellers that way. But in terms of like the written word, it, I think it's King and Seuss. I don't remember whether the only one I would I would add would be O. Henry, but I don't remember if he was like the turn of the twentieth century or still the uh, last of the nineteenth, because he he was a huge influence on the short story form. But other than that, I yeah, you're probably right. For yeah, sure. that's, that, that's my opinion. I'm a Bradbury guy, but even I can't say like yeah, Bradbury is a huge influence on a lot of people. But I like Bradbury. You bet. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, secretly he's not a science fiction writer. Great fantasy writer, but not a science fiction writer. Yeah, well, depending on your definition, I suppose that's true. Yeah. I, I if you go by the fact that he never did a word, like he's admitted, he admitted many of his interviews that he never did a bit of research. He just basically was from his imagination. Then he's actually 
he's ultimate fantasy author if you really sit there and think about it. Because it's sure, just because his fantasies happen to involve, you know, trips to Mars and whatnot doesn't yeah, necessarily yeah. mean that they're not fantasies. I'll, I'll, I'll cop to that, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that's kind of, so I mean, so when I look at it from that perspective, it's just like, yeah. So yeah, I'm a huge Bradbury fan, but I mean, that that's me. Um, you're a Stephen King person, Dante Macabre. Uh, and who else? There had to be other people that really, really, really grabbed you. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, okay. So Anne McCaffrey was a big influence. I found my way. Okay. So, um, because it was such a prolific reader, my librarian at my school was excellent. And he would recommend to me a bunch of classics of children's literature. And uh, I also was one of those people who did the Children's Choice Awards voting because he knew that I would probably read every book on the list. <laughs> right? And I, yeah, I pretty much did, right? Um, I, I found Anne McCaffrey through Susan Cooper somehow. I don't really know. I think someone, I was talking about Susan Cooper, her Darkest Rising series. Uh, I don't I don't remember. I think someone, I said I was doing the Children's Choice Awards. They, shaggy dog story, I'm sorry. But uh, they said that, um, well, if you're liking the Children's Choice Award stuff, you should check out this Newbery Award winning stuff. And of course, The Grey King was a Newbery Award winning. So I read that. And then I'm like, okay, I love this fantasy stuff. When someone said, oh, and she was a big influence too, of course, right? Susan Cooper and Darkest Rising series is amazing. If you haven't read it, you should read it. But um, then that pointed me in the direction of Anne McCaffrey. And, you know, dragons, dragons. I love dragons and she's such a good character writer you know you believe her people and I think that really drives her stories um I also I you know when someone says what's your favorite novel right what's and picking a favorite that's a hard one right because of course you know I love a bunch of different books for a bunch of different reasons but the one I have read the most and I read it for the first time when I was 10 as well was Watership Down really really i know it's people are like what you know yeah okay first of all it's classic fantasy right it uh consciously follows the hero's journey format um except you know like it's it's not i don't know if, if your only acquaintance with it is like that cartoon back in the 80s uh it, it, the reason why the cartoon was not for kids is because the book is not for kids it's uh it's I don't know it, 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 it I get a different thing out of it every time I read it and I read it about once every 10 years right because there's That's a new exactly. life lesson well, well I I you go back and read a book right you go back and, and it looks like Doris loves that book too um it, I have not read that book I'm sorry I just I haven't got to but there are books I've read and I've read when I was a kid and I read it as an adult I read like in different points in my life because we become different people throughout our lives because we yeah. we all our experiences change us for better or for worse they change us and I look at the fact that um like I love the Wheel of Time of Robin Jordan but I so but what I appreciate about it has evolved mm -hmm. over the years the meticulous planning and execution of the world building and the amount of work he put into it the older I get the more I realize that is not a story I ever want to do because it's like the work he put into that is incredible. Just the background, the culture. Like, yes. like, uh, like I think where what I love about Jordan in particular, it's the voice. Every culture had a different voice of how that it is true. There. And that that's an incredible feat. More often than not, like 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 that like attention to detail it's often missed in a lot of fantasy novels even today because mm -hmm. it's a lot of work right the Emperor, I, I mean having having someone go with the empress may she live forever which was very much like one of the ascension versus mm -hmm. how someone from andor acted towards right the, like he did he thought about that big time and like older me is like from a techni technical point of view yes 
emotional. I love that kind of world building. I just eat it up. I think it's amazing. I'm uh, an anvilite, means I'm someone who uh, is a fan of World Anvil, which is a world building utility. If you haven't heard about it, Publishers Weekly recommended it for science fiction and fantasy authors in their most recent list of, you know, stuff you should check out in this year. And I've been on it for about a year and a half and not looking back, right? It's it's exactly designed for that kind of world building and I love it. I do all, both, uh, both my major series and world building uh, different sites for them there. I'm using it like a combination fan wiki and um, series Bible, and it's awesome. So, so yeah. So for me, my favorite bit of world building are like the two authors I look at when I build my world are Roger Zelazny, Michael. Moore. Yes. And and sorry, which? Michael Moorcock. Oh yeah, it. he's amazing. Yeah, no, but I don't but, even like his writing half the time, but I'll read it anyway because I like his world. So well, but, 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 cool, but if you look at how they <laughs> world, like it's not like anybody else in fantasy. Yeah, nothing. No, no it's not even close. Like the Lazny, the Lazny, right? For example, he's he's all about the character. Like, like yes. especially if you look at his Amber series, it's all yes. about how Corwin looks at the world. Yeah, he because he has so many like. My still my favorite my favorite thing I stole and I did a, I did a Shadowrun campaign I I actually nice. I, I I teleported at Amber's like tarot cards oh that interesting card to teleport to different places because right it's, it's fun it was damn cool Why right not? yeah yeah and, and I I stole different things I stole a few different things from that oh Shadowrun's great I'm I, a huge Shadowrun fan too I love it yeah I, yeah, I play yeah. a lot of different RPGs it's one of my favorites yeah. yeah. No, because it's a simple game. In in the sense, like the mechanics are really simple. You don't necessarily have to go by all the rules. Like the, I hate the Matrix. It's the only thing I hate about that mm -hmm. game. I hate it because it's it's too insular. I did a game with, with the full Matrix. I, I I I did it. The problem is the Matrix is great if you're doing a full hacker run, and then I'll use yeah. it to the nth degree. But if you're doing a run where you're having different teams doing different things. Yeah, you either have to be good at doing cutaways, right? Or you've got the rest of the gaming group sitting around going. <laughs> well, no, that, that, no, 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 that, that, that it, like, that's the problem. Like, it's such an intricate system. It's such mm -hmm. an intricate system that it requires a very, very specific kind of game set. And it's very hard to do that and balance what everybody else is doing at the yep. same time. It can be done. I'm not saying it can't mm -hmm. be done, but it's not intuitive. Whereas no. you get a game like Exalted or a game like Werewolf. I've played Exalted, and yeah. I'm a huge Werewolf fan. I, we had a campaign that ran for 12 years, yeah. I think it was, a, a Chronicle. It, yeah, it was a, great. It's a, classic, it's a classic system. But the thing is, it's very intuitive. Yes. Very, it's very intuitive. Whereas Shadowrun, it's very, very I, I love Exalted too. I, just, I love the crazy combo system. It's like playing Devil May Cry, except on my. <laughs> Yeah, so nice. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but the thing, but the thing about that, right, is, um, that that's right. It, it's it, like it's, hence Devil May Cry. I'm a big Devil May Cry. Like that's why I like that. So, um, but the thing about that is, right, Shadow that like, that part of the game just doesn't fit with the rest of the game. So if I'm doing yeah. if I'm doing a Matrix run, it's just a Matrix run, right? I, right. I, I, right, right because it, it's the only way I feel it's fair. Whereas Whereas if I'm doing like a full team, I'm like, I'll simplify the matrix run because it's right. because it's like, well, I'm going to make it yes. No, I'm not going to worry about your skills because we're not going to worry about the ice too much. We're just going to be like, do you bypass it or don't you bypass it? Right. I'm not going to worry about it too much because that's play the game because everybody wants to play. And right. So, right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, sure. Streamlining. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. But going back to, like, to world building. Yes. I love, I love how Zelazny and Morcock does a similar thing actually. He doesn't he doesn't go into great detail he doesn't go into great details about the world, which adds I think a little like if it's done correctly, it adds a layer of magic to the world. Because what you're doing and what you're saying is you're creating you're creating like this you're letting the reader imagine the details. You give the right mm -hmm. details and like now, my personal favorite of Michael Moorcox is Hawkman. 
I love them. I oh love them. Yeah. yeah. I think Hawkman. I think Hawkman's amazing. Yeah. And, and and I think like that's my favorite. It's not Elric. Elric. I see why people like Elric. Yeah. But for me, but for me, it's Hawkman because Hawkman's got this like weird, like this awesome con contact at the very beginning. The jewel in the skull, like the chip in the head that if he doesn't do it, he totally obeys. How he gets out of that. And this yep. whole empire that, that, that you know is just the scum of the earth. You don't really need to know too much other than how it treats treats them. And it's so good, right? But it doesn't have, like, the names and titles and, and the meta. Like, you get a little of a meta story. And mm -hmm. I think all good fantasies need a, what I call a meta story. But you don't always need it to be so concise. I don't think you should be lazy like Terry Goodkind is. Like, here's a map. You ha have fun. I'm like, thanks, right? And <laughs> right, right, that, that's Terry Goodkind, right? Um, I don't need to be that lazy with it. I think you do need like a a do need a meta story, but you can keep it very simple, and people will still come along with you for the ride. And I think Moorcock and Zelazny are masters at that simplicity. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, but like I said, but there are some people that really dig the world building part. Like I look at like the option in that spectrum is Brandon Sanderson, right? He's like today, yes. like that, 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 that dude will come up with like a, a formula for how his world works. And it's like, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. It's, it's brilliant, but I find that a lot of people are using it now like a straight jacket and they're not taking what, you know, like it, hard world building, as they call it, right? As he calls it, has become like the thing that everybody is doing. And, you know, there's still room for soft world building in there. You can get mushy on the edges. And then I, I, I don't know. I, I don't want that to be lost, right? Uh, well, it, it's. I mean, not that his ideas aren't great. Like, they're amazing, and I have uh, I have watched his videos. I've drawn from them. No question about it. But, yeah. Well, again, going back, like that's it. That's why I love Zelazny and Moorcock. They have that. It, it is very mushy, but in like the best ways. It's totally right. like, in the best ways, right? So, I I bring all this up to basically say that, um, like I I feel like. Like it's just like going to what you're saying. The big message is important, but ultimately it's the characters and what the story yes. you're telling there. That's what matters. Everything else is nice. If that makes sense. A story is happening to someone you care about. If you don't give a shit about the characters, then neither will the readers. You have to make the characters somebody you want to find out what happens to them. <laughs> It's my belief, anyway. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's it. Like, like we all have to find something to relate to. Like, um, like well, I guess I'm doing Alice right now. It's like, well, what's my rel relatable point? And honestly, I think in this time, it's very appropriate facing your fears, mm. right? And that's a very, I think that's a very real thing we're, we're all dealing with right now. And and you know, um, we live in a fearful time. And yeah, it is a fearful time. Yeah. So we have to. So we have to. We have to at some point confront those fears, and confront that dragon, for lack of a better word. That often. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. That that's mm -hmm. like we. That's the world we live in. We don't live in. We don't. Right now, we live in a world where it's like, well, what might happen? It's like, well, bad things might happen, but so might good things, and you won't necessarily know until you take those risks. Because that's what life is. Life is risk. And it always will be. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what time, what effort. And while there are, there's definitely wisdom in being cautious sometimes, right? There really is no safety. Like, right? Yeah. It doesn't really exist. That might be the great story we tell ourselves. So my husband was in a major car accident 11, 12 years ago now. It came out of the blue you know, nobody saw it coming. Uh, he was literally given a 0% chance of survival, right? Like I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not exaggerating. We've seen the medical records. 
the odds of him recovering as much as he had, I think we've worked it out to something like one in 10 million. When you put everything together, it's various injuries, like his aorta was burst on the scene. He should have died on the scene. He didn't. Anyway, that whole experience taught me that you can have whatever plan you think you want and life's going to throw you a curveball anyway. And the truth is this is rented, right? We don't get to keep the house. We have no. to give it back at some point. So life is too short not to take chances on things that mean something to you. If you're going, well, what would happen if, well, what will happen if you don't? And then you get to that point, the accident, you know, uh, like in the series Dead Like Me, maybe a toilet seat from the space station is going to fall on your head suddenly and kill you, right? It can happen any time. So yeah. it, are you happy with what you've done with your life right now? If you're not, go do something that makes you happy because you never know when the plug's going to get pulled, right? Well, I, I, I have, so one of my favorite so I, I got to watch NYPD Blue during this time. First time I ever actually watched the show. I'm not cool. I know I lay <laughs> My favorite scene in the whole series, though, is almost it's probably the most metafiction part where he sees the ghost of his partner. And the quote that always stuck with me is, life is long. Life, everybody mm. thinks life is short, but the truth yeah. is life is long. It's long on possibilities. And every day we wake up, there's always a chance something different will happen. But every day we wake up, there's always a new opportunity to do new things. And even though, and, and the thing is, I think the other thing too, every time we talk to somebody, meet somebody, interact with somebody, we only have a limited time with that interaction. It's a precious mm -hmm. thing because there's only one of us. And yeah. whether you're meeting somebody at Starbucks, like leaving this, the Starbucks person is picking your order for this ridiculous coffee you're paying stupid money for. Doesn't matter, right? That's a one, possibly a one time only opportunity, one time only interaction. And instead of treating it for how precious that really is, because that person serving you has a life, dreams, goals, hopes, just like you do. Right. So you can treat that as a chance to know somebody. You can treat that as a chance to commit to nothing. You can do, like, we have so many choices in those moments. Those choices dictate our possibilities beyond the store, beyond right that moment in time. And then you meet people, you connect to people. And but you only have a like finite that. time. Yeah. You only have a finite time with everybody. So instead of treating it like as eh, just another big deal, no big deal. It's like actually it is a big deal. This is, is this it. why you do this show, Josh? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Makes sense well, to me. Yeah, because because okay, you're Diane Marcy. I never knew you up until like I met Sarah, who is the author goddess, right? I interviewed yep, her. Good friend of mine. Yeah. Yeah, I interviewed her a while ago. She was fun to talk with. She's very very fun. Um, and, and I'm like, well, this is a cool group, and I get to meet people, do things, and and and. But it was like an opportunity, and that opportunity has led to other opportunities. Like I got to be part of Conduit. I got to make yes. an ass myself. I got uh, like with not just with her, but with the Joe <laughs> Compton a little bit later on that day. I, I got to do one with, about podcasting in general. That one I actually sounded informative and stuff. I was almost an expert. You did sound good. I listened to that one. I'm trying to make my way through all the VODs because, of course, uh, one of the planning committee people, I didn't get the chance to actually really watch anything, right? So now I'm going back through the, the VODs going, oh, that was good. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, I didn't know this person. I'm going to go look up more about them and see if I can find them on Twitch, stuff like that. So that's that's been really cool. Yeah, uh, yeah you were good. Yeah. And I love Joe. I've, I've, yeah. uh, I've known Joe for... I want to say nine or ten years now, and he's awesome. No, Joe. Joe's a sweetheart. Like he's legitimately yeah. a sweetheart. Um, he's one of the sweetest dudes I've ever met. Yes. Oh yeah, yes. absolutely. We're all absolutely. Peeps. That's right. Yeah, some of us are Twitch peeps. Yeah, yeah you bet. Well, and, and I. I have a Twitch channel. Come check it out. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's the whole idea. We all help each other, right? Like exactly. Like, yeah. Like I, I like I have the numbers and I've been on this quest to become an affiliate. It's just like and it's like Okay, so all my peeps who are watching, come give Josh a follow, guys. Get him to his affiliate. Let's get it yeah, going. Yeah. Rising tide raises all ships. 
Yeah. Well, no, it, like I actually, it's been it's been really cool. I'd like to watch. Like I, I've been I've been uh, I've been rated a lot more, which has always been a lot of fun. All right, it's just like, hey, I'm getting rated now. I'm starting to make. I'm starting nice. to make waves, right? Cool. Well, yeah. Well, well I, like it's funny too. Yeah. She, she, so her trick see the see stable Aradia up there. Oh, I have it. Oh, I have it up there. That fine. Oh, word. Yeah. Twitch.tv slash Sable Aradia. Yep. But uh, no, I uh, I got the, like like that's the thing. Like I've been very impressed by Twitch. It's surprisingly a cool community. Again, another one of those things I think a lot of writers have not taken advantage of. Yes. Yes. Twitch is an amazing platform. It has been really great for me to connect to the writing community to people who are interested in writing and in what I'm writing in particular. And you're right. Um, there's no writing category on Twitch, which is something a bunch of us are trying to change. There's a petition. I wish I had the link handy, but yeah, yeah that'd be great. So I, yeah. I, I, I put it in there. And it'd be awesome. Doing it, but no, you know, what, I, I, I it's hard to connect, right? And it's hard to connect. And it isn't something that a huge amount of writers are doing. So yeah. Yes. It's like, there you go. Jag's a writer slash editor. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, are you? Jagtress. Okay, I'll remember. I'll go check you out. Yes. I'm always looking for other writing channels to follow. She's, a, she's also a gamer. She's that mixture between writer and a gamer. So that's Sure. Cool. Yeah. So, well, I actually, so, I mean, I mean, we're talking about frontiers of the future. I actually, to me, I think games are, are the future of writing. I, I think, I think, honestly, books are always going to be there. Don't get me wrong. We're always mm -hmm. going to or you always want to read stories. But I've been looking at this more and more and more, and I'm like, video games have the advantage, man. They have the advantage. Here's the thing. Video games are interactive participatory fiction, and some people are doing some... Some of the best stuff that's happening in science fiction and fantasy right now is happening in video games. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, even if you're not interested in playing video games, I don't get time to play a lot of video games because I'm always writing. But go like watch the the videos of the cutscenes that they make on youtube because that's some cool shit, man oh absolutely <laughs> no no it's like my favorite story um uh, and i get it i'm just i'm a i'm a fan i'm a fanboy for the sit franchise i admit it is uh, yeah. Persona 5. i really love persona 5. Oh, okay um, right my uh but, but probably my my favorite of the last um 10 years i'm old i'm always shut up um, uh, is I actually, you know what, if I was looking at an RPG like story, I enjoyed start to finish, even though I think the aligning wasn't quite right. Nino Kuni. I really enjoyed that. It was a young adult story. Um, starts heartbreakingly fast. And, uh, okay. I have to admit, I have to add one more to that list. Tales of Delia. Made me okay. It actually made cool. me cry. Yeah. It actually made me cry. I, I admit, nice. I, I'm, yes. I'm more in touch with my feelings as I've gotten older. I've become a big softy. I've always been a big softy. Never got Most over it. Are. Most of us are. It's. I, I think. See, when we're younger, we think we have to be tough, and yep. we've got to armor up, and and and, and not think, which is stupid. But right? mm -hmm. you realize it much later in life that you're being an idiot. It's actually you're not tough, not feeling anything. You're actually tough when you let yourself feel everything. That's I agree when you with that too. And grow and evolve, and it's hard. And I mean, I, you, I mean, we all have our limits. Like, but we're truly strong when we're vulnerable. Yes. And that's that. That's because when we're willing to be vulnerable and we're open, that's when we can let good things in life happen, right? And that's that's when you know. That's when you know you're strong. And that's when you know you can deal with absolutely anything, no matter what. Absolutely, I agree. I, th I think Ooh. you. I think I scored. I scored some points today. I'm not sure, but I think I scored. Some points. We're gonna be friends. We have a lot in common. I like you. No, it, like that's that's what I, that's what I've learned. Like this is what I've learned about life. It's like as we've got as I get older and hopefully wiser. I certainly got my money. I'm, I'm probably going to be doing crazy shit until I'm probably 90. Probably. Yeah, good. I, I'm not. Good. I, I'm just I'm just wired that way. I'm just like, I'm only here once. Let's do all the crazy shit. Like, um, but, um, but, like, for me, it's just, I realized that 
when you break life down, you break it all down. Just do what you love. The people you love. That's right. That's it. That's it. Nothing else matters. It's nope. all dust in the wind, dude. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 all, that all said, I'm not going to lie. I like hot water and toilet paper. You'd be amazed how, <sighs> how much that is the foundation of modern modern civilization <laughs> really founded on those two things. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, go without. And you will find that there's a lot of things. People think coffee. Yeah, that hurts. But you can survive without coffee. You can. All right. Hot water? That one's much harder to deal with than you think. It's a simple yep. thing that you take for granted. Yep. Right? I've been poor enough in my life that they cut off my gas for six months. I know all about not having hot water. Uh-uh. <laughs> Don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> that's the one that's the one that hurts it's not it's not like like that one everything else can go like and i admit this i i spoil myself rotten in this sense hot water does those showers are my favorite because i remember a time when i had nothing and yep. i mean it's like am i a little luxurious with it yep yeah. Oh, yeah. If I get in a hot bath, you'll not get me out for three hours. I'm not yeah. even kidding. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, no, no, screw that. Like, simple things. Yeah. Right? Simple things are very much are very much the way it goes. I, I'm, I, again, I, and, and now the terrifying thing is once I've realized all this, it's like, I barely give a shit now. What am I going to be like in ten years? And it's like, oh God. I, 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 oh god! I, I, I'm not thinking about anything. Right here, very little. Like, I, like I, I'm hard to, I'm hard to terrify or threaten now. I just like I can, I can only imagine like in ten years that like. Eh, I'm do? developing a granny weather wax sort of reputation as I get older. <laughs> oh, I'll take god. it. Oh, god. Yep. That's <laughs> me. <Yes. laughs> So for anyone that doesn't know, Granny Weatherwax is probably, yeah, I, my favorite character Terry Pratchett wrote. Besides Mine death. Too. De besides death. Death of the Well, death okay, no, you're right. Death death wins. And, you know, shout out to Death of Rats because that's just awesome. Yeah. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, aside from that, Granny Weatherwax for sure. Yeah, yeah. Gr Granny just, just got shit done. That was the thing about her. She just gets shit done. And that's and it. Yeah, and she's very, very curmudgeonly about it, and and, and but it's always affectionate curmudgeonly, right? Like her criticism. Um, okay, no, you you have to work to piss her off. You have to work, right? But if you have pissed her off, you are doomed. If, if most of the people, she's like, well, you know, get your shit together. But it's genuinely meant in love. You know? Well, it's it, it's not so much that she, she's at that point in her life where it's just like. And, and it, she has like, no time for fools. She's done with that. Well, well, that's just it. Like, like no, nah, it, it's just it's not even that. It's not even that. Like, like here's the thing. Like about growing old. This is one thing I noticed about growing old. The best and worst thing is your patience goes to shit. It's the best <laughs> yes. thing, right? It, 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 it's the best thing because you tolerate far less bullshit. Yeah. It's the worst thing because sometimes, sometimes, there is shit you need to hear. There is shit you absolutely need to hear, right? And you ain't listening. And you yeah. ain't listening. And you almost have to reteach yourself. No, 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 no. So I, I look at, so I fight, like, I, I live in town. My dad's in town. We fight a lot more now because he's yeah. that old per marginally. And, and, and I hate to say it. And if he ever listens to this, he's going to hate this. Dad, you sound like my grandmother sometimes. <laughs> I, I, this is the, like, this is the thing, right? Because, that same thing. He's been alive long enough now that he does not have a lot of patience. And sometimes it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, it's like, okay, you really need to understand where the people are coming from <laughs> so you can actually, like, you, you, you do. Granny Weatherwax is in that boat. Every, she's been around so long, she tends to forget that other people have different experiences sometimes. Yes. She's not foolish about that. She knows this in her head. But it doesn't always translate. And that's what makes her partly why it makes her such an endearing character, too, because she's not perfect. 
I love Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid. Yes. But the only reason he works is because you got to see him drunk in the first one. Because yes, it was, that's a very good point. I've you know I've said that before, so that's cool. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm glad you took to that because he's vulnerable. Like again, yeah. thing, there's a chink in his armor, and that's why he works. If he didn't have that chink in the armor, he'd be almost this mystical guy. But because, because on that day and that moment, he remembers everything he lost and it breaks him. It still breaks him all those years later because, yep. it, because it, he, he was terrified because it wasn't just his wife he lost, but an unborn child. So it just yeah. it breaks him on a bunch of different levels. And for that day, for that day, he, he needs to forget because it hurts too much and that honestly like that's like like that's where like you saw that it's one that's the moment where daniel took care of him and that was a great it was a it added something very special to their relationship and that's why later on um like my favorite two that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie my other one is after his knee gets taken out mm -hmm. by that little kid and he's down and he's like, you know what? I want to do this last fight. I don't care. Like, it wasn't about the victory or defeat. He knew he was going to get hurt. Mm -hmm. He didn't care. He needed to prove something to himself. Miyagi understood yeah. that. And that was right, right. Miyagi understood that. That's my other favorite scene because it's like, Miyagi was like, you, did, you, you won respect, says, but not mine. And this is where I need to go do this and finish this. So I have this. And that, awesome, yeah. yeah, right. And that, and that, it's one of the cool. It's the best story, in my opinion. That's the best story beat in the whole, because that's that's a story about self-respect. When you break the Karate Kid all down, right? Miyagi yeah. There teaches Daniel karate, but so Daniel can build the confidence to become some someone better than he was. And he and Miyagi was the good teacher, and Reese was the bad teacher. And you got to actually see the light dark. It, it, it like that is it's a cool movie for that reason alone. Um, is but that's the story. That's the storyline beats that make that really, really, really work. And you wouldn't have those storyline beats if you didn't have those characters being vulnerable. And everybody has things in their arms, and they should. Oh, you have a very good point. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, I do. I've seen that a lot, but yeah, yeah I do. I I totally agree. Yeah. I've uh, I've had similar discussions. So yes, ah, very well. Well, let's let's get to let's get to the heart and soul of this. Okay, so yes. your book. So this is your third campaign, right? It is. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. things make sense now. One of your Twitch VODs has a person I recognize, and that must be the Sarah you were talking about that you both know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sarah Berman, a.k.a. Author Goddess, is a good friend of mine. She's the author of the Rune Spell series. You know that if she was on uh, Josh's podcast. I actually didn't see that when I was up to my elbows in uh, conduit preparations at the time. Well, 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 well no. Like, yeah. like, Sarah's cool because, because again, we don't see things. Yeah, she was. She was totally yeah. different there. Sarah's cool because, again, we were just, we, we, we were just different enough that mm -hmm. that there was a there's a again we agreed on a lot we disagreed on some very mm -hmm. cool human being very smart woman uh yep. sharp, very sharp i think that, that that's that's the thing about her she's very sharp and very knows her shit and uh yeah. and isn't afraid to say what she thinks that's why i like her there yeah. is so yep. that's why i like her uh, neither am i i just haven't had a lot to disagree with yet <laughs> yeah. it's like it's like oh it's like holy shit, he makes sense what the hell yeah. Gonna be very, this is going to be very hard to have our, our like uh, conversation this way, but well, I should say though, you you've done three campaigns, same series yes. or just different different. No, and uh, different projects entirely. The um, okay, so my first campaign, I had been self publishing the Weird West Chronicles as a serial through Amazon, and I the first six stories had a uh, consistent story arc, and I thought, this, okay, I want to put this together in a paperback. But there's a lot of hidden costs to self-publishing. If I mean, you can just throw it up on Amazon with a basic cover on it, and nobody's ever going to fucking read it. They're not going to read it, right? You you have to put some effort into that if you want people to read it. So my favorite my favorite thing was with I, I, the Calgary writing community is very sweet, and I, but I am going to say this very nice. There are some 
really good cover designers there. Uh, Brent Nichols, aka Jake Elwood's great. Like he's mm-hmm. holding at it, but he's the exception, not the yes. general rule. And, yes. And, and uh, the cover uh, uh, says the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, um, so Jay, so Jay, my my solution is I I I I have a big mouth. And I find people that are really good at it, and we and I talk to them, and they say sure, right? And yeah. and I, I, all right, and that's the thing. Like I know good people. If you and, and I'll say for anybody watching, listening, if you struggle with covers, at the very least, I can point you to good people who do great covers. Yeah, you know, look me up too. If yeah. Josh doesn't know someone that works for you, I might know a few people. Yeah, yeah I can point you in that yeah. direction. Yeah. So yeah. So, but the one, the, the worst thing is you do not, you gotta be very careful of stock photos. Because yes. you, get, you, you can do some cool things with it. I'm not gonna say it's a, it's, it's a complete no-no, right? I'm not gonna say that, but you gotta be very careful about that. It's actually, yes, it's a little pricey sometimes, but honestly the covers, your cover, um, your cover and your edits you spend premiums on. Yep. Because honest to God, you need both. You yep. cannot, you cannot do that. You are Please. preaching the Bible here. This is, this is it. If, uh, if you must choose between them, choose your editing because the cover might be crap, but your editing will sell every other book after that. But if you can do both. And that's where you spend your money. I, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So D- Doris, Doris, this is Jag, Jag, Doris. You guys will get along. I did know you, Doris, er- earlier. It was last week, I think, actually. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was. No, Doris was great, and uh, no, it was last week on Thursday. I interviewed her, so she's really fun. She's a fun awesome. interview. Awesome. Nice yeah. to meet you, Doris. Yes, but I bring all, I bring all this up and say all this because. And I actually, I would go so far. This might be the closest thing we've had to a disagreement. I think the cover is actually so important that you find a way, because it, you, you do need to find a way. Yeah, I, I actually think it's that important because you want your book to stand out. It, like the first thing is, it's got to be a good story. Yeah, right? number one. That's number one. Number two, it's got to stand out, and it's not just on the inside, but on the outside. Because you are asking. Me, what you have to what you have to do what you have to realize is see unlike any other art form we are asking our readers to commit to time hours yes yes before they even look at the book they have to be very comfortable with what they're seeing and that's the bottom line and showing and here and, and this is something i this took me a very long time to learn and i'm, I'm getting there like i have actually it's too hot to actually dress in a full like suit right yeah. now. But I was I did a life coach interview about six weeks ago now. And one of the things we, we did was um, we talked appearance and presentation. And it's not really about the appearance itself. It's that people consciously pick up on the effort you put into these things. They just do. Sure. Like it's one, those, it's one of those things that they just do. So you gotta be, and you gotta be aware that if you're doing something that is common enough that a lot of people are doing it, then you need to figure out ways to stand out. Your yes. voice is number one. Mm-hmm. Pretty presentation is number two. And it's so you're not wrong. Yeah, but I will say that I have had great books ruined by shit edits. And so oh, yeah. part of the problem in independent publishing is that there is, not everybody has this point of view, but there's enough of it out there that you run into it. And that is, if you were a real writer, you would publish traditionally because nobody else has given you validation that your book is actually good enough to be published. So people read independent published books with a far more critical eye. If they see one typo, you will get a four in your review instead of five and they will trash your ass. So you really do have to make sure before anything else, in my opinion, so hey, maybe we are having a disagreement, the editing, yeah, you gotta write a good story, assuming you have written a good story 
and you believe in it, editing must take priority. But Josh is not wrong. People do judge the book by the cover. They will not pick it up unless they like the cover. The cover is your movie poster. It has to look good. It has to stand out and it has to fit some genre expectations so that they know what kind of product they're getting. Exactly. And you have fun with it. No, no, no. I'm not. Um, by the way, I should clarify. Edits are number one. I'm not disputing that. When I say that the voice is, has to stand out, that includes the edits. It does. A a a and finding a good, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And poetry is a little different. That's a harder, and just, just cause Doris, I know you're doing haikus. It's harder because I love because, haiku. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Um, because you don't have as much room and that's a good thing and a bad thing because it's not about really making your stuff tight. It's about making your stuff fit and it's not quite the same thing. My partner says that Twitter posts are basically haiku that are less elegant. So if you want to practice the skills, either way. <laughs> I, 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 I would. Yeah, no, I, I, I actually, I, I, I can recommend, I, I can recommend some decent editors if, if you, if you need them. So, um, depending on your style, actually, in your case, Doris, I wouldn't be a, like. I know in particular there's a comic book editor I think that would do you well. I don't know if it would be quite what you're looking for, but it might be. So talk to talk to me at some point and we'll we'll uh, we'll talk. Um, but, Eli uh, Quake, who is also a friend of mine, uh, recently published a book called Hindsight Being 2020, which was a collection of poems and stories, and uh, they successfully kickstarted that one. Uh, you might want to talk to them about who their editor was. Yeah. Right. Just because familiarity with poetry and it was it was excellent yeah no it, it's like i said everybody's a little different right every like i'm doing a story poem kind of for that with alice so my editing is about tenses and keeping it tight like in tightening yep. some stuff up because that yeah i i inflate i i admit it it's like you know not my shit sometimes thinks it's just the way it is right and 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 i'm, I'm good with, and i'm good with that and i and unfortunately I, I do know good people the other thing that makes it harder though is it with indie is quality of editors vary and yes that's, that's, <laughs> that's a lot of people that. tout themselves as editors who have no idea what the fuck they're doing and if you have no idea what the fuck you're asking for then you can't spot that yeah, yeah. no it, it's it very it very much is that way like there was a book i'm not going to name names but uh um all right uh they're not going to name names i read the book there's a certain whimsy to it that that it almost works, but I was reading it and I was like, man, I could cut some of this stuff out and it would be better. Mm -hmm. And and also because it was an audio book originally and turning it into a, a, again, audio and the written word are different enough that you can't quite do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was, it was a very, it was a very, so reading it, it's a good story, but I could look at what the editor did and it's like, they bloated it up a little too much mm -hmm. loaded and it might, might not be and the editor might not know that's the thing too um i look at again it's easier to see other people's stuff but when i can really see when i can really see certain edits it's like eh, you know i think i don't think they were what you were looking for you can have yeah. a really good editor who's been excellent for other people who just doesn't get what you're doing either. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no, and, that, and that's a big part. Like, like that fit is hard. That, that might so in traditional publishing, getting an agent's the hardest part of the job. In, yeah, in, in, in indie, in indie, the right editing, like the right team around you, that's the hardest part of the job. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Right, because yeah, it's all it's all about it's all about team. But yeah, so if we're gonna do it. If you're gonna do it, in Doris' case, because she's so freaking talented, she doesn't have to worry about the art stuff so much, <laughs> right? Nice. But nice. Um, but for all the rest of us, it's like edit first, appearance second. Do not. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. You're talented. Don't ever doubt that. If you're uh, lucky, if you can do your own art, you are saving uh, a great deal of money and time and frustration. Uh, that it's not 
Okay, I, I've started to illustrate as well. I'm not going to say I'm great at it yet. I've gotten a lot better from the great at it yet. But even so, there are projects of mine I would not draw. Because sure. I don't. You recognize your own limitations. I am. Well, it's, it's, not even, it's not even limitations. Sometimes it's style too. Right? Yeah, that's they're, another they're, thing. They're, yeah, like style, style sometimes, the tone. There are some things I'm not going to, it's, it's like anything else. When you write, there's a particular tone, voice, and style you're great at. And there are some things that you're just not, now I'm not saying, you, I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not saying you, you couldn't do, um, let's say, let's, 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 what's the most out there thing I can, I can compare to like, maybe, maybe like a purely literary fiction style. I'm right. sure you're capable of doing it, mm -hmm. but it may not be quite in your comfort zone. And you right. might not do the right style pieces, the right tone pieces to do that perfectly. So it may not be the right go. Then again, you might discover, let's say you were doing something like a thriller. Thriller isn't that different from science fiction in a lot of ways. That's very it's, true. Right? So yeah. you might you might find like a secret home there. You're like, oh, I found something new that's awesome. You got to take those chances to some degree. But no matter what we all have limitations and we have to kind of work within those limitations look i the alice i, I got the same person that did the first alice book kenzie because she's so talented at it awesome I, I, and also her tone's perfect for the story i couldn't do that i just couldn't and i just know it Mm -hmm. so. I have a friend, his name is Aaron Sadal. He is a professional illustrator and he does amazing work. He did some work for me for this series, the Toy Soldier Saga, which is I'm uh, publishing book one. That's the Kickstarter I currently have going. It's called A Few Good Ls. He did some great images for me and I uh, I can't use them for what I, for my book cover. And the reason why is because the genre is already kind of a, a, as you might guess by the title, it's a bit of a mashup. It's a science fantasy. It's black powder fantasy sailing in space with elves and orcs, right? So there's like a whole mixture of, it's like, I, I describe it like World of Warcraft meets Master and Commander meets Treasure Planet, right? And if... if Aaron has a slightly cartoon kind of style. Now there's nothing wrong with that. It's awesome, right? He's done some amazing work and particularly for RPG and children's books, right? Amazing. But I knew that if I put anything cartoony at all on the cover, nobody would take it seriously because it's so whacked out and it's not a YA book. It's a serious book. It's a war novel, so, right? So you could theoretically, the only way anime would work, if it was something like manga s, like say Cowboy Bebop. Maybe. Yeah, that could have worked. I I could have uh, if if I'd connected with the right manga artist, that might have worked. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's like, but I'm, otherwise, I'm I gotta I'm, go. You know, no, I have no, to no, have no, like, a different. Again, style. you have to make those. Like, that's part yep. of the decision making process. So I mean, you you have to figure that stuff out and and go with it, right? But I mean, just. Uh, yeah, you just said like whacked out. Yes, yeah, so we we can we can appreciate that, Jag. We can totally appreciate. Yep. It. By the way, Jag, Doris, Doris, Jag, you two would get along. Okay. Yeah, you did. You said that. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, he's I, probably I, 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 insisting. It just, it just sunk. It just it just sunk in that, that like those two will get along very well. It just that just sunk in. It just took a minute, but it sunk in. I'm never gonna. I'm never gonna. I'm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm, just, I'm gonna get you. Yeah, no, it's um, but um, that all said, uh, now that realization has come in, no, like like indie like indie books, crowdfunding books. Um, okay, you've done you've done indie, you done you haven't done indie, and you've done crowdfunding. What's the biggest difference for you? Um, between indie and crowdfunding. Yeah, like for you personally going through that experience, because again, they are different. I don't they think they really, really realizes that until they go through that process. But for you, what, 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 when did you realize that? I put out a novelette. That was my first uh, dip my toes into indie publishing. When you know, create space was still a thing before Amazon forced us all to be more convenient for them instead of use the thing that actually made sense and worked anyway. Um, <laughs> but, um, 
no, we're gonna argue about that one. That's fine. No, no, no. Okay. The Amazon overloads are watching. We're on Twitch, right? So yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. You know. It doesn't matter what I say about Amazon. They don't care. And I have no choice but to deal with Amazon. So, yeah. but anyway, um, yeah. And, you know, I, it, it was so much just finding out information. I, I felt very kind of isolated. It, there was so much, like, it, it felt like shouting into a void, you know, buy my book, buy my book. Here's my book. Cricket, cricket. Right. You know, it, it it was just it was it was frustrating and disappointing right and i guess that uh i i tried uh i tried the the weird west series had a little bit more traction when i was writing it as a serial that was all indie published initially right and i was uh you know i i guess i was kind of building up an audience right and then by the time that i finished the first six stories i went you know I want to do something with this, but by this time I'd learned a lot more about independent publishing and I learned about all these hidden costs. And I learned that if you want an independent published book to succeed, you have to have the money to put into it. It still comes down to money. The people who succeed spent money on it, right? Mm -hmm. They, they, that's, that's why, right? So, because otherwise you never would have seen it and you never would have paid any attention to it. I don't have any money, <laughs> right? Like I've, I've been poor my whole life. So I, uh, I went, well, you know what? Let's, let's put it to the test. Let's see if there's a market for it. You know, people tell me they like this stuff. Let's see if they'll crowdfund it. Right. And I went, okay. And if I want this to succeed, I need to have, you know, I need to have cover budget. I need to have an editing budget. I gotta have somebody do the layout because I suck at this shit. If your book is formatted funny, Right? There's another thing that'll get you a shit review as an indie writer. And I have no patience for that. Right. So all this stuff. And I went, okay, so this is what I think it's gonna cost. Gave the my you know, breakdown budget. I didn't realize other people didn't do it that way at the time. I was just kind of ignorant. I just went, okay, you know, I viewed it like these people are gonna be my investors, right? So I have to account to them how I spend money, right? Was my attitude about it. So I went, okay, so this is my plan. And it was a lot better because, first of all, um, you know, you, you, it's, it's almost market research as part of the process. If people will fund your book, you know there's an audience for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was that, right? Secondly, it made other people feel like they were invested in the process. It became a community around the idea, which is really nice. Writing can be a lonely job. It's nice to have support and know you have support. Right? And the third thing is that Kickstarter is also very good at being a method of marketing on its own. It has a lot of visibility. It's very good at getting word out in places that you wouldn't be able to do on your own. And it gets attention, right? So between these things, I found it was much more fulfilling. And I felt like, you know, this isn't, you can't say to a, a project that has been crowdfunded, well, it's not a real book because, you know, somebody else didn't, you know, put their stamp of approval on it from the, you know, gods of the big four, you know, right? Like it, it is because the people voted for it with their bucks, right? And at the end of the day, that's all that matters. I would love to continue chatting with you, Miss Miss Diane. Unfortunately, I still got a day job I barely care about. I have to do because I got no pay worries. My, pay my people. However, um, you should talk about your current campaign. Do you have the Kickstarter link? I do have the Kickstarter link. Um, I will give it to you, I guess. Yeah, give and, it to me. I'll put, yeah. it up, I'll put it up. I'll let you do. I'll let you do a, your spiel. That's what you want to do because uh, okay. that's always a good. That's always the way to do these things. I apparently, right. I, I apparently know what I, I know what I'm doing or something like that. I swear. You All might, right. you might have been doing this a while. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I, 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 my whole secret is I just don't know what I'm doing. And you asked Jack, yeah. which will probably tell you I don't. I don't really know what I'm doing. But anyways, I, I, I joke. But that all said, um, we had a great interview here. Um, we have. Tell people about your current project heard fun okay. or like where it is i mean it's funded which is awesome but now you got to do all the cool bonus stuff now because i mean you got that's right up there and, right and next time i have you come on the show we'll talk about how to actually build a bonus kickstarter because you're actually building a kickstarter is actually two tiers one yes. the, the the stuff that you really care about and then the stuff that you'd like to have 
and then you quietly build that behind the scenes because oh crap i might get funded on the first day and now what right so right right and so it, it it does happen so this will be my first experience with that the other two kickstarters kind of barely made their goal on time so yep. i'm uh, i look forward to the conversation Right. Yeah. Okay, so this is A Few Good Elves. It is intended to be book one of a five book series, which is another reason why I'm going crowd publishing. It is a uh, military fantasy space opera that uses basically age of sail technology with magic flying ships in space. It is also a war novel that, uh, you know, elves versus orcs, right? But I kind of went with all those tropes and I said, okay, so what if they actually were a thing and how would they actually work if they were real? So hopefully I have, uh, I've done enough grounding. It is not a young adult book. It is, uh, it gets pretty graphic. It's a war novel. I don't believe in sugarcoating war. Um, I have been working on this. This was my first NaNoWriMo novel that I finished the rough draft of 10 years ago. I've been kind of tweaking it ever since because I lack the confidence. You know, when it's when you're a newbie writer, you're like, you know, and you're finally taking it seriously, you're not confident. But um, in the meantime, though, I have published five short stories and novellas in the same universe in various markets. A couple of those stories have been published a couple of times. And I realized finally there was a market for it when a guy who I knew 10 years ago who was reading the first bits on my blog said, are you done yet? Look me up and ask me that question. So uh, it's a passion project. There's a whole extended universe around it. And I would like to make a really nice book. And you guys have helped me do that. The next plan is audiobooks. That's the stretch goals. How good they are depends on where we end up. Fair enough. So how can people find you? You can find me pretty much anywhere on the internet at Sable, Aradia, anything except for Facebook or Instagram. I don't do them, but I'm on Tumblr. I'm especially on Twitter. I have a Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Sable Aradia. I am, I don't know, I'm on World Anvil. You can find me under that name there, or you can search the Toy Soldier Saga and you will find me on World Anvil or the Weird West Chronicles. That's weird with a Y. Mm -hmm. um, and I also have a blog, dianemorrisonfiction.com. Very cool. All right, everybody. So I'm going to do that last one because I think that's, that's important. dianemorrisonfiction.com. So go like check her out. So we all know that, ladies and gentlemen. So that's this this episode of just joshing. I got a really cool week still ahead head there. Uh, Eli K. Wake is Friday's guest. Susan Force is Wednesday's guest. But the one that really has me, I I will admit this, I'm really excited about this. Stephanie Phillips, writer of Harley Quinn for DC Comics, is my Thursday guest. I won't miss that one. I, yeah. I won't miss Eli's either. Eli's a lot of fun to talk to. Um, they're also a friend of mine. So yeah, no, it'll be it'll be really cool. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking like I said, I have a really cool week lined up. So Susan Forrest tomorrow, 7 p.m. Stephanie Phillips, 3 p.m. Canada Day, and uh, and then Friday, 7 p.m. again. It's gonna be a great week. Thanks for everybody watching. Thanks for everybody listening. Stay inspired. Keep shining in the dark. I'll see you guys tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Likewise.